This is Relationship Truth Unfiltered, a podcast that ditches destructive traditions and delves into real biblical teaching about relationships. Welcome. I am Julie Sedanko here with Jill, a courageous woman who has transformed her life and her marriage through incredible resilience and hard work. Hers is a staying well story. Over the past six years, Jill has been on an emotional roller coaster, but is creating a healthier, more stable environment for herself and her children. Jill's journey is a powerful testament to the strength found in setting boundaries, seeking therapy, and being part of our supportive conquer group. Jill's story is not just about surviving, but thriving and finding real peace. Let's dive into her inspiring journey. Jill, welcome. Thank you so much, Julie. It's a joy to be here. It's good to have you. So Jill, can you share just a little bit about what looking back now were the clues that this was emotionally not a healthy marriage? Sure. Looking back now, I realized that there were times that I felt like if if I asked for too much or I asked for it in the wrong way, or um, if I shared an opinion, it would come across as criticism, even though I wasn't being critical. If I would ask for what I needed, it wasn't always received and heard and reciprocated. I also noticed that there would be sometimes triggers that would cause anger to flare. And no matter what I did or said or how I worded something, Sometimes the anger was directed towards me and I didn't understand why. So it was very bewildering. Can you give me an example? Uh, maybe is there a certain incident that you remember that would mm-hmm. kind of illustrate this? Yeah, I would say just even, you know, if there was a struggle at work or difficulty or frustration there, that um, sometimes I would, or I'd need to share something that was negative, for instance, you know, a mess that maybe from family or business that would need to be dealt with. And I would share that information. And instead of getting, you know, listening and support, I would get um, what I now know is an immature response. This, why are you bringing this to me? And, um, you know, this is just going to ruin my day. And, and, you know, why every time I pick up the phone and I hear from you, it's just everything is negative. And I felt like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm just trying to work through this business or financial or um, situation with the kids. And I just, is if this isn't a good time, we can pick another time. But what I found out is um, sometimes the point behind that is there is no point. There's nothing you can say or do that will get them to listen. And, you know, maybe at that point, it was like, you know, why I don't want to, I don't want to continue talking to a person who's negative like this. And um, it would be about me as a person, instead Mm -hmm. of just, hey, this is too much for me. Can we talk about this after my meeting? Or when I'm more relaxed, it was more about you are bringing garbage to me. And every time I talk to you, it's this and it's you I can't stand. So that would come across and I would just kind of Wow. knock back like what in the world and then my punishment would be i would be hung up on i would be ghosted for days and it was i don't want to talk to a person like that but what i the pattern that i found is then i would kind of go behind the scenes and i would start fixing things myself so you know i would you know talk to my panel of experts and they would give me advice i'd you know call an attorney who would say here's how you can draft a form to fix this with the client i would just kind of go to work and overwork and work even 20 sometimes 24 hours a day believe it or not 20 hour days i could even work taking care of the house the kids everything just to keep things fixed so that i was not this awful person that would have to come and bring these problems as a partner and share them so That was something that, you know, it takes its toll, but that's a huge part of the pattern in a nutshell is that if I did or said something, or if I just happened to be the unlucky person or the safe person, I should say, who um, would pick up the phone and always listen, maybe, you know, there was a situation at work and he couldn't scream at his client or he was Mm. still, something was triggered from childhood about the bullying that he'd gone through, which is really unfair. He's an amazing human being. No one should treat him like that. And the same thing with, you know, the kind of the dynamic from how he was raised and how his parents invalidated him. And, you know, he's angry and he never has a voice. So here's one situation where he's upset about something that happens at work. And then, he, you know, I would find sometimes he would pick a fight with me. And I was... Yeah 
untrained. Now I'm trained to understand, okay, there's an emotion behind this. Let's see if we can, you know, he needs to vent about this. Don't take this personally. If it becomes personal, you put that flag up that says, you know, I didn't do this to you. I'm doing hey, everything. You, I, you were doing a lot of walking on eggshells. Yeah. Oh, yes. Marriage. I mean, you were pretty much a professional eggshell yes. walker. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes. And exactly. you became, you became his sounding board but it was in a very unhealthy way. Would that mm -hmm. be fair to say? Yes. And um, to the, and I think it, it, sounding board in some sense, but I feel like um, target in another when things would turn to that point of toxicity and the less respect I had for myself that I would grovel and try to fix things, then the less respect he would have for me. So I feel like it turned into this negative spiral of me being trying to fix everything, which only led to extreme resentment in me. And that resentment comes out. I mean, there's no way to hide that resentment. So eventually, I feel like it just became this toxic dance of me taking everything that came out of his mouth the wrong way, even when he didn't mean anything by it, because I was, you know, it was just like we were conditioning each other. And um, it just got to the point, you know, every time he picked up the phone and heard from me, he would cringe. And I would brace thinking, what reaction should I just handle this myself? Should I tell him, you know, and never mind the fact that I was kind of a loving extroverted, um, bubbly, um, encouraging type of wife whose love language is words. And I was starving to death in my own marriage for positivity and love. And then we would have great moments and then we would be back on the crazy cycle again. So I think we learned to not trust each other. And um, it was a very painful, painful time. But yeah, eggshells. Mm -hmm. Eggshells for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I can somewhat understand when I lost my sister, I actually lost three family members uh, in my sophomore year of college. And I had a lot of anger and I didn't have anybody to talk with. There was nobody. I, I was 2000 miles away from anybody who missed her, anybody who knew her. And I didn't know what to do with that anger. Mm -hmm. And I had a boyfriend and a wonderful, wonderful man. And I did. I, I turned it on him. I can mm -hmm. remember Jill standing in a grocery store, checking out, hoping cashier would give me a hard time because I wanted to yell at somebody. Mm -hmm. And I knew that wasn't healthy, but I didn't have the skills of how to process and how to release some mm -hmm. of that. And, and I, that relationship rightfully ended. He broke up with me because I wasn't very nice to him, mm -hmm. but it seems as though, and I'm not saying you should have broke up with your husband, but at the time, mm -hmm. as this cycle was happening, you didn't have the boundaries to say, it's not okay to treat me this way. True. And of course, we were very young when we got married. And then realizing that just because he was raised in the church and with Christian parents didn't mean that they taught him the real meaning of love. He had to learn that. And then learning unconditional love through our church family, in addition to all of that, brought us to this place of, I mean, what a beautiful marriage we had and have now. But what we, and it's a work in progress, but what we had then was amazing. And it was just such a time of peace. And I also learned to step back and say, you know what, I'm not going to go head to head and confront. There were sometimes situations where there was dishonesty, but I recognized where that came from. And it was these little lies. And I'm not saying little lies are okay. They're not. But even just my husband throwing away his fast food container in the trash outside, I recognized these things. And I said, honey, it's okay if you needed to stop for food. His mom used to say to him, that's stupid. What are you doing? You know, every little thing he did, every move he made. So there were times that he would think, I'm not going to tell her that I'm going to stop over here. I'm going to do this because he would see me as his mom. So he would choose not to tell me. But then when I would find out, I would just go at it. Here you go again. Finally, I got to the point there was a big whopper told just about how he had managed to purchase a computer. He said he had bought it in a trade with something. And one day I got a phone call from someone who said, hey, I work with him and he's, you know, he owes me this money for this PC. Turns out he wasn't going to pay for it. He was going to return it because it wasn't what it was supposed to be. But I had a moment where I could either call and get help from another sister in Christ from my Bible study group. And I was the leader of all things I'm calling and saying, 
pray for me. I, you know, I don't have a lot of details I want to share, but I am on my face before God because I'm going to screw this up. I'm going to come in guns blazing and I'm going to make this about me. And for the first time ever, Julie, I was able to stop, take a breath. When he walked in the door, I didn't say anything. I think Leslie would be proud, but I'm not sure. I hope so. But to just sure wait for the right time and just say, hey, crazy thing. I got a phone call today. And this is what I heard. Long pause, calm, regulated, and just said, you know, you're my husband. So I, I believe you, you know, this is what you're telling me. You're telling me that this is what the case is, but he's telling me this, and I'm going to leave this between you and God. Literally, that's what I said. And that was, I feel like the beginning of hope and mm -hmm you know, that triggered a brokenness in him. And he said, I don't want to lose your love. And I know that sounds like a very selfish and immature way to phrase it, but um, he didn't want to lose what we had. And from that point on, I'm going to work very hard to tell you the truth. And I'm very sorry. And, you know, I don't want this to happen again. And so um, that, you know, fast forwarding, that was a beautiful renaissance. And this, I think, is a cautionary tale that, you can go forward and you can go backward. And yes. this is something you have to watch at all times. And I'm not saying a bad day isn't going to happen. Please never think that it's the end of the whole world because there was um, a red flag popped up because it's something that's old history and something small happened. And we just want to, you know, say, oh, it's the end of all things that I will even tell myself, oh, I'm being dramatic again, but with eyes wide open saying, no, no. Um, you know, let's pray about this. Let's give it 20 minutes. And, you know, we're paying attention to behaviors and attitudes overall in myself and in him. Because again, if I had come in guns blazing, what did you do? You're like, you know, if I had acted like that, and that wasn't typical, but more like crying, pleading, I don't understand why, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not regulation. That's not being an adult. Um, we could have gone backwards, but fast forwarding a little bit, we grew so much in faith and learned under our senior pastor and his wife, who was the associate pastor and just grew and grew and grew. God led us to found a business and we were so, we are still so faith filled, but we were so faith filled to take these risks, like in the middle of a recession and the two of us together as husband and wife linking arms. Um, we had a six month old baby when this was all happening. And at certain points we, you know, might've had a hundred dollars in the, in our checking account and just what God brought us through and the success that he gave us was all because of faith, trust and working together. But there are, some of the toxicity started to come back. I would um, ask questions about the finances like, well, wait a minute. I just read that we're supposed to have a business plan. You know, we kind of jumped in and got started and we're making profit right away. So things were going well. But I said, you know, well, what is the long range plan? And realizing that that's my husband's not the bean counter. He's the one who will jump and obey God and work with his hands, but he's not going to be the bean counter who has like a 10 year spreadsheet. That's not going to be him. So my panic and demanding something from him. And he said, look, I'm doing this by faith kind of led to a more of a toxic dance where I became kind of like when you're, um, I could just imagine like walking on water. I can't, I've never, obviously, you know, this side of heaven, that's not going to happen, but you know, just kind of, you're doing it. You're making this work. You're taking the next right step. But then I got into panic and I kind of looked down and was like, oh, we're succeeding, but what happens next year? What happens the year after that? And how are we supposed to get financing to grow? So I started wanting these answers. Um, and then my husband would just react and react and react. And I would react to that. So it was just insanity. Have you ever found yourself saying yes when you really wanted to say no? Do you overfunction and secretly resent it? Fear conflict or dread disapproval even at the cost of your own well being? Friend, you are not the only one. That's why Leslie developed the Moving Beyond People Pleasing course. It's based on her 25 years of private practice and thousands of hours helping women. Moving Beyond People Pleasing is a transformative small group coaching program designed to help you break free from the chains of people pleasing and reclaim your voice. Doors are open now, but they will close soon. The program includes unlimited live weekly group coaching sessions, 
lifetime access to a comprehensive video curriculum complete with transcripts, handouts, and homework. A private Facebook group where you can connect with a supportive community, ask questions, and get encouragement between coaching sessions. And you'll get an exclusive ebook only available to moving beyond people pleasing clients. Whether you struggle with conflict, feel manipulated, or want to stop living for others' approval, this course will guide you to discover and embrace your true self. Don't wait. Join Moving Beyond People Pleasing today and start your journey toward a more authentic, empowered life. Visit lesliewernick.com forward slash people pleasing course and take the first step towards lasting change. Maybe in some ways we all can relate to this. Mm -hmm. We we each come into our marriage with a certain amount of baggage, Mm -hmm. our our personalities, wherever we are on the Enneagram and, and our certain styles of dealing with issues and problems. And I don't know where your marriage was on the destructive scale. There was definitely yeah. some destructive, mm-hmm. yes, s- some destructive dynamics there, mm-hmm. but you both in some ways contributed it to it. And I mm-hmm. think, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the reason that you're able to stay well is because it sounds like you have a husband who's somewhat willing to do his own work and you're willing to do your own, but it's kind of like any journey. Mm-hmm. And I hope that y- you who are listening would hear this, that this journey towards staying well or having a great marriage is not without flat tires. Oh, yes. It's not without pit stops. It's it's a journey. Why? Because we're all imperfect. And because, you know, even as you're learning things through Leslie's resources, we mess up. We just immediately kind of sometimes resort back to old habits and old things. What were some of the the key things that you learned from Leslie in helping you to stop responding in your fear, whether Mm -hmm. it be with your business or your marriage? What Mm -hmm. were some of the key lessons that you learned? Yeah. Um, Well, some key lessons that helped me were to recognize, I think that sometimes the point is there is no point. So if there, if an argument is triggered or there are behaviors that aren't healthy, one thing I learned from Leslie is, you know, to just simply kind of put that hand up and say, hold on, full stop. When you can speak to me respectfully, we can continue the conversation. So even just understanding that simple boundary to say, hold on here, I'm feeling personally attacked and um, the language that's being used, I don't, you know, that hurts me and it's hurting our marriage and dynamic and it's changing how I feel about you. So being able to put that boundary up in real time. What if he gets angry at you for saying that? Because I can already hear Mm -hmm. um, the lady saying, but uh, if I said that to my husband, he would just tell me. Yeah. So so how do you handle that? Because I'm sure your husband didn't didn't say, Uh uh-huh. Oh, well, honey, of course, take, take a break. And I certainly don't want you to change. How did Mm -hmm. he react to that? Yeah. The reaction, um, you know, obvious, it may be obvious to some who've been through this, that it's like, well, you're arrogant and you're trying to control the conversation. Um, And I feel like that's kind of the projecting part that can happen. We can all do that. We can all project, Mm -hmm. but I feel like that's what would happen is, um, you know, oh, you know, you don't want to finish the conversation right now. Well, you know, if you walk out that door, here's what I'm going to. But I think at that point, you just realize if you and with all due respect, you know, I'm married to an amazing man. But there are in inside of each of us can be a little child. So if you yeah. realize, hold on a second, I'm 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 acting like I'm a little child myself, like I'm feeling fearful, like I'm two years old and and I need someone to get me a drink of water because I can't reach the sink. Hold on. I, you know, I have a job. I have this. I have that. I, I'm a lot. I'm ridiculously in charge of myself. Calm down here. So I think we all need to have those moments. But just knowing in that moment, nothing good is going to happen after this. If you want to stay well, sticking around for that conversation is only going to wound you and reinforce 
you know, terrible patterns. So just to respectfully say, hey, I'm running out for groceries. I've got to go pick up the Instacart anyway. So how about we can continue this conversation with the kids not around? That would be great. And, you know, even if there's anger, you do not. One thing I learned is I don't have to absorb the anger or negativity. I can imagine a shield around myself. Mm -hmm. And I can say, you know what, this is just as if one of my five children was little and having a tantrum. I could have a meltdown. Anyone could. But when someone does to, I guess, respect yourself and respect them enough to say, no, like, we're not going to let this whole scenario play out, where I'm going to, you know, take take a little drive, I'm going to be over here. And, you know, we can talk about this when everyone calms down. And the miraculous thing is, is I think when you handle things respectfully and respect yourself enough and respect your spouse enough to say, this is a bad moment and to come back later and say, can we redo this? Can we start fresh? Because who knows? I mean, maybe I contributed in some mm -hmm. way, but I feel like many times I don't. But that's my vision of it. Of course, I think I'm right. Of course, I think I'm, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. The other thing I think that's important for me is looking at reality for what it is, but also, again, realizing I'm ridiculously in charge. So bouncing things off of counselors and saying, you know, I kind of feel like this was all me. And they step back and say, nothing that you ask for is unhealthy, out of bounds, or um, impossible to be given. This is what I hear. Now, if you did this with a coworker, or if you can imagine this with your child, so they would run scenarios with me and show me, hey girl, you know, you're really, really what you're asking for is no big deal. And, you know, maybe what you're asking for in him um, or the changes you want to see in him, could you bring this to him in a way, kind of a teachable moment after the fact and say, I can tell you got very upset when I noticed that you went out to breakfast without me. Um, I told you that I was hurt. I wanted to spend time with you. We can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. And, you know, if he says to me, hey, this makes me feel like a bad person, I'm not going to take his feelings away. He feels that way. But what I say to him is, uh, my feelings are no reflection on you. This is just how I feel. Mm. Um, I don't want you to feel like a bad person because I have a need. However, I still have a need that needs to be met. And that is for us to just spend some time together apart from the kids. How can we get that need met? Would it be okay if we did lunch instead? So just recognizing even that even in these small things, that how can we change the dance? So we're asking clearly for what we need using I statements and not attacking the other person and honoring the other person does feel bad. So, you know, counseling has been instrumental and Leslie's group, I can't overstate enough just some of the I feel like they're one liners, but really they're just like guiding principles, mm -hmm. just even at the time when there are times I think when um, my dear husband can fall into a pattern from the past. So can I, I can fall into patterns from the past, but just in his family, he was, you know, only allowed to play a certain role and say certain things and be show up a certain way. And if not, he's treated as though he was dead to them. I guess recognizing that he can, pull that same pattern with me. And for me to kind of interrupt that pattern and say, you know, come back to me here. I have a difference of opinion. I have the right to speak my needs. And um, if not, then all I am is a robot. And this mm -hmm. is something that Leslie and explaining about the cell phone um, illustration, you can just, you can just love your phone. It does everything for you. But then when it doesn't do what you want, oh, this stupid phone, my kids will joke if if they hear me shout big dummy they know that i'm yelling at technology it's always technology mm -hmm. an inanimate object but it's okay to say that about a phone it's not okay to treat another human being that way when we disagree we dig in we lean in with love and say i wholeheartedly disagree with you on this um could you pass the potatoes i can say that <laughs> i grew up knowing I that but instead of like um i wholeheartedly disagree with you one of us is a bad person and i need to turn my back on you i need to split and see you as a terrible human being i need to think of through observational bias all the things that make you a terrible person i need to tell you that that is not acceptable.
And then being able to just kind of on wobbly legs at first, repeat some of the things that Leslie said. And Leslie answered a question that I had typed. And literally she was like, she laughed out loud and she was like, oh my goodness. So what are you? Are you a robot? Um, you know, just like a Stepford robot that, you know, you're not allowed to have any opinion if, if, you know, and that's when I think I realized that I was enabling that and that was a pattern from the past that needed to be broken. So now again, not to rail against someone and say, you always, and this is you. I had to watch that and not being diagnostic. That's not my job. You mm -hmm. don't make a relationship work by using terms like you are gaslighting me. I mean, you are, you are this or that and stick a label on someone's head. You don't love someone if you're going to label them, but instead to watch the behaviors and say, hmm, I feel like I don't have a voice here. How can can we continue to have this discussion that I'm, I don't want to cause offense in you, but I need to have the right to speak my truth and what I need here without you being offended or my feelings are going to become non-existent for you. And that's not something that I want. As you're explaining all this, it's just like, wow, that's amazing. You, you seem so strong and you've grown so much through Conquer and through your therapy and different things in actually having the words, because I think that's one of the hardest things is when you're mm -hmm. in the moment yeah. and they're doing whatever they're doing, getting angry, it's hard to have the words. That's why, you yes. know, our Moving Beyond People Pleasing course, our summer coaching course that's happening right now mm -hmm. is so powerful because some of that role playing mm -hmm. that you're talking about some yes. of that feedback into specific situations that might be happening in your life right now. Mm -hmm. It's really, an, it's an incredible value, first of all, for all that you get in those weeks of coaching, but it kind of will give you the ability to practice some of the things that you need to learn mm -hmm. to be able to have these boundaries. I would tell a younger version of myself, look, cut him loose. It's okay. This just happened. You stated your boundary. That's what I do now. You stated your boundary. You explained the behaviors that, you know, are going to be healthy going forward. What, what it require, what is required to be in relationship with you. Now I want you to just forget about him. And that's something I learned from Leslie is like, let it go. Ruminating about this, trying to solve it, reliving it, focusing on the negative. Oh, all these things happen. What am I going to do now? That is not the point. Stay ridiculously in charge of yourself and your own emotions and say, I need to do this for the sake of my kids. That and also choosing a period of time to grieve. All of us who have been through situations like this, there are things that we wish we had done different with our children or there's grief in various ways. But if we take that grief and we, you know, just wallow in it, put it like a pack on our back and, oh, here I am, what was me? You're no good to God. You're no good to your kids. And you certainly are not creating health in your own body and moving forward. You're being mired in the past. So to say, you know, I, I did the best I could. I'm on a new path. The only thing I can change is what's right now. I'll make amends as I can and as God brings things up to me. But also, if there's grief, make a time to grieve. You know, I think we as women, sometimes mm, to good. certain cultures, you know, hey, if I feel sorry about this, then I'm paying my penance. No, you're not. Jesus already paid for all of it. That grief is real for what was lost and, you know, whatever the situation is. I would make a time even if I said, okay, if I'm just going to get through dinner and once dinner is just about done and I am about to call the kids, I'm going to give myself five minutes to grieve. We had a situation with our firstborn daughter. She's estranged from the family and we feel we haven't done anything to deserve it. But even just as sunset would happen and I would realize I don't have all my little chicks mm. in the nest and my heart is just torn to shreds. Um, I would feel the grief coming, but I'd say, I I'm going to grieve between six o'clock and six o five. And during that time frame, when I feel the need to grieve, I'm, yep, I feel something popping up now, but I'm doing other things. I'm going to set that aside until this time. Yep. It's that old feeling of grief. Again, I recognize that I feel the heaviness, the tightness in my chest. I'm just going to get a cup of tea. I'm going to breathe and I'm going to set aside that time. So I didn't ignore the past or what happened or what suffering we were going through, but it sure was a heck of a lot better than bleeding all over my children that were still in the nest and calling my husband, using him as a Xanax, if you will, 
No, I mean, it's, it's knowing that stay regulated, get the help and healing that you need, but know that putting one foot in front of the other every day is the right thing to do. Just do the next right thing and choose regulation, choose peace for yourself. And when you realize that you're ridiculously in charge, you are not mired in the past. And that includes old baggage. You don't go back to old hurts. I mean, yes, things can come up that can trigger memories in us and we remember the past, but I think it's completely unfair to label yourself or, or your spouse to say you are still that person. If that person has worked hard and is working hard and you will know they're working hard because you have the space in the relationship to bring your needs imperfectly at first, but you'll also see that they're learning to regulate themselves. They're learning to be kind and calm and rephrase things. A hard thing too is you can't succeed and stay well if you're going to demonize the other person. Neither do you want to be demonized. So you don't want to split and see that person as like the walking personification of evil. How in the world? You don't want anyone to treat you like that. That's dehumanizing someone. And if you're constantly rehearsing that in your head, it's very hard, no matter what they do, Mm -hmm. to, to switch that off and then love them again. Some of our ladies they've got some very abusive situations. So I don't want to make light of that in any way, shape or form. At the same time, like in the situation with your Mm -hmm. husband, he is trying to do his work. He's not Mm -hmm. doing it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And we talked before, one of the hard things for me, and I know for you, is when you think of the past, your husband remembers it differently. Mm -hmm. My husband remembers it differently. True. I know that I know that I know my version mm-hmm. is right, but mm-hmm. he feels the same way. Mm-hmm. And I think that we can yep. get so stuck on trying to convince yes. them that the past and the way you see it, they have to agree with. Mm-hmm. No, they don't. No. What we need to deal with is, mm-hmm. do we have healthy patterns now? Yes. And that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that how has your husband, and he's not perfect yet. You're still, I mean, even today wasn't perfect. So, right. But how has his behavior changed over the years and what signs Mm -hmm. of progress do you see now? Mm -hmm. A good question. Um, And it's progress in both of us. Um, But I would say, you know, we are working on more transparency between the two of us and learning to trust each other with things. There was a phase that we went through where I had to go gray rock. Gray rock is when you just sort of smile across the the dining room table and you don't say much besides, you know, "Hmm, nice weather we're having. You don't open up emotionally at all. Basically, you go behind a wall and that's more of a self-protection measure. And I never recommend that more than temporarily. And that's sort of as a stabilizing thing, like everything I'm saying is being interpreted wrong. I'm going to go behind this little wall and I'm going to do small talk for now, but we can't stay there forever. But I want to say the behavior changes. I mean, we used to go, it's kind of like a mini version of what his, um, what my in-laws do on kind of a huge scale, huge toxic scale where you're out of the family, we'll never talk to you again, we'll drive past you for five years, you can wave in the yard, we live a mile away, but we're not even, you're dead to us. But it would be mini versions of that. So it would be, I'm on the road. I don't want to deal with the crap that's happening at home. I don't want to hear anything about the bad clients or what the latest spreadsheet says. I'm going to stonewall. I'm going to ghost. I'm not going to talk with you. I'm going to send you to voicemail. And we walked out of that, as I set boundaries over a period of six years. And I mean, my husband, if he's eating, he wants to eat. You know, he's if he's focused on something on the project site, he has to focus. But other than that, he'll pick up the phone. But here's my part of it. I literally had to teach myself to smile and chuckle in the beginning and think of nice things to say first so that when he picked up the phone, he heard a regulated calm, kind, sweet voice, because who wouldn't want that? And then even if there had to be something difficult to be said, I'm approaching him like a decent human being. So it was both sides. So all of that started to go away when he started building trust and being dependable to say, you know, I could be upset, but you know, you can catch me later. We might've had like a tough text exchange, but I will pick up the phone and chat with you. Another thing is the opposite of what it used to be, where we'd go for days without communicating. And that would include the young children as well, who kind of were 
grouped in that, unfortunately, that we will talk to each other on the phone if he has to travel. And it's kind of like the partition is dropped. We'll have the phone call open for two and three hours and we'll talk about anything at all. And just, you know, a child walks in and, you know, tell daddy what you did today for art class. And then she's gone and we talk about something else and learning to share space. So that is huge, hugely healing and hugely trust building. Another thing I would say, allow people to say what they need to say. Don't take everything personally, listen to what they say. But if something comes up where someone attacks you, ad hominem at your person, you have the right to say, look, I'm not a bad person. Um, I don't deserve to be labeled as a person like that, whatever that's supposed to mean. You know, maybe you don't like to spend time around me if I'm whining or I need this afternoon just to stare off into space because of, you know, New York City traffic, uh, Jill. I just, you know, I'm not ready to have a difficult conversation right now. You can do that. Um, so and noticing that he can do things like that. And um, I've also noticed that he takes more time for self-care. I mean, in the sense of I need some downtime. I can't work, 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 work. And both of us have actually come very far in that regard. And again, times for me, I want to just say, especially to the women who've been through so much, but yet they're, they're, they're seeing change in their husband to encourage that change and don't take responsibility for the successes or the failures. Amen. That's not yes. you. It's him. It's his story. It's his journey with Jesus. You work on your journey with Jesus. Um, we all hope that we're going to be married until we're old and wrinkly. And, you know, we want to have those stories that we, you know, see that are just so beautiful, but we have to write it one day at a time, one moment at a time. And it could even be just something as simple as my husband isn't responding to me. And I can tell myself a really stupid story about that. And I think it's something that women can do. So you're in the process of healing. You tell yourself, oh, this is just like when he used to ghost me for six days. He doesn't love me. He doesn't care. I want to tell you that yesterday I meant to do morning devotions and call my husband when he was out of state. All I could do was send him good morning, praying for you. And then I remember, I think it was not until um, 930 at night that I could get back to him. So it was a 12 hour span, I think, that I could finally say, I'm available to talk if you have a few minutes. In mm -hmm. no way. I thought about him throughout the day. I prayed for him. I guess what I'm saying is we can tell ourselves stories and send ourselves in these crazy circles. If you can get clarity from your spouse and say, hey, you know, hey, I haven't heard from you. Is everything OK? That definitely there's got to be respect back and forth that way. And there are times when I will tell my husband, I'm feeling a little ignored. And the text message that comes through is hearts and flowers and little things. And for someone who like loves the written word and spoken word, that's my love language. But when it doesn't happen, going into a tailspin and then, you know what I, it's just, I feel like the devil sets us up to get upset, but not taking that bait and just recognizing that it's my emotional regulation and the stupid story I'm telling myself that can get myself, that can trigger us to be back there. So, you know, calm, peace, joy, we say we want it, work towards it. Don't provoke the opposite. But again, Know that sometimes if someone's in a tantrum or in a negativity spiral, it's not about you. I've had to rehearse this in the beginning when we were first walking out of this. No, I don't make you angry. You don't make me angry. You and I, where we put our arms and legs and what comes out of our mouth is completely us. We are to be self-controlled, not others controlled, nor we can't blame the other person. We're not puppets. So it's a choice what we choose to think on and whether we work on ourselves, whether we want to demonize the other person or even be overly dramatic. So even recognize hormone cycles for me to Amen. say, yes, oh, I'm being overly dramatic. What's going on? And just recognizing, no, no, I'm not managing my mind here. You know, what do I need to do to show up and be a respectable wife in order and to honor myself? And I've also had to say, when things haven't gone well, I'm worth more than that. Oh, come on now. No, I'm worth more than that. I will also say that when a tantrum happens, I will refer to certain types of words or attacks in which can come from either side, either husband or wife as verbal vomit. When someone does that, 
You cannot take anything that they say for gospel truth. You can't say, oh, this is, you know, this is the word of the Lord. No, if somebody loves you, they will deliver something to you in a regulated, kind and calm way. Anyone can have a tantrum, but to just say, um, you know, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to show up like that. And I can say to my husband, is this really the way that you want to show up? Because I'm thinking this isn't, this isn't the way we're doing things now. I want to ask one more quick question. I said when I introduced you, this is a staying well story. Yes. And at the same time, we're all those of us who are still, still married. It's a staying well story, but that means it's staying well with boundaries. It's it. It doesn't mean that the last chapter has been written. There are going right. to be setbacks and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So how do you stay well? and balance maintaining hope that things will continue to go in the right direction, but also stay vigilant about potential setbacks in your relationship. How do you balance those two things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is because of hope that you press in and hold those boundaries. And what I learned early on is that 26 times in a row, I would be tested. No, I will not be spoken to like that. No. You know, if you're going to walk out that door and I'm not going to have abandonment issues about that. If you walk out that door, I'm going to put on a movie and pop popcorn with the kids. And if you wanted to join us, you could come back. But I'm not going to participate in that dance. And it's being vigilant, vigilant, vigilant. And that is the kind thing to do, because um, if there's anyone that you love and you want to make things work with, boundaries are not a wall that you hide behind and you say, nope, that's it. You know, you're going down the rejection chute as a person because you didn't meet this boundary. The boundary is designed to teach people, here is how I operate at my best and this is what I need from the relationship in order to, to be my best and to show up as my best person and to trust you the way that um, our relationship needs. So that's what it's about. So if you have hope for the relationship, setting boundaries is an extension of that hope is what I see. And recognizing that training and training oneself is something that's done over and over and over. So I would say if somebody has let a boundary drop, the best thing you can do is get right back on that horse and say to yourself, because I have hope that this relationship can work, I must never let let anyone speak to me like this. If if I'm being yelled at, I have a plan. I grab my purse and I head out, you know, and here's where I go. My mom is here and I'll drive there or I'll go visit my friend or whatever. Always do your very best to hold to that boundary. It's so important. So boundaries and training, I think yes. if I'm hearing you right, are the mm -hmm. two things that kind of help you to stay well. Mm -hmm. and to stay vigilant at the same time. Yes. So things are well, but I'm going to stay vigilant. I know my boundaries. I'm not forgetting my boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I have trained. Uh, that's why yes. we have moving beyond people pleasing. Exactly. People pleasing and walking on eggshells and mm -hmm. trying to do this ineffective dance is mm -hmm. not the way to have a healthy relationship. So train yourself how yes. to have a healthy relationship. And Jill, mm -hmm. I'm just so grateful that you are, you have done that and you continue to do that. And thank I you. thank you for sharing with us an example of what staying well looks like. It's not perfect, no. but it is possible. Mm -hmm. One last thing before we go, if you could share just one piece of advice with a woman listening right now, what would you say to her? Behavior is a language. And what is his behavior telling you? And how does that work with what you want from your marriage? And what does your behavior say in response? Behavior is a language. That's so good. Thank you for that. Thank you for listening to Relationship Truth Unfiltered. Don't forget to sign up for Moving Beyond People Pleasing. It's a life-changing course that will empower you to break free from people pleasing and live authentically. Until next time, may God bless all of your relationships with him, with yourself, and with others.